So we're going to start here right away. Uh, I have a bit to cover, and uh, so let's just get into this and um, go back to topic 14. Um, you may notice if you're looking at the PowerPoints at home or if you haven't printed off, whatever, I'm skipping a few things. Okay, I've decided uh, you know where I want to focus because I do want to have everything done and have a little bit of time to talk about the, the exam at the end here. Um, so I've condensed some of the material. Doesn't mean it's necessarily less important. Um, it just means usually in most of those cases we've sort of already talked about in the last couple of weeks. Um, their PowerPoints slides are in there as kind of reminders as we go through our body systems, right? So I might point out a couple of those places where I skip some things. Um, we finished off, we were talking about respiratory infections and uh, my goal last day had been to talk about influenza and uh, talk a little bit more about bird flu and things like that, uh, which I'm not going to do. We talked about bird flu during our epidemiology lectures uh, a little bit. And uh, so just kind of some flu basics to remind you of some of the things that we've discussed over the semester, right? So influenza is, is the cause of the flu or, or influenza, influenza virus. There's a couple of them out there that typically infect humans, influenza A virus, influenza B virus. And uh, there is usually new strains that float around every, um, every year. And uh, every once in a while, due to antigenic shift, we get a pandemic strain. So, you know, that's every 30 to 50 years, kind of just depending on what's going on in the world. Last time we had a really nasty one was 1918. There was, uh, it was the 1950s, there was a pretty bad one floating around in Hong Kong as well that didn't become a pandemic. Uh, and then 2009 was the most recent one that was, you know, bad for some people, but uh, um, it was kind of a unique little virus anyway, and we were able to take care of it mostly through the vaccination, and now it's uh, basically endemic, at least in England. Uh, so we're never going to get rid of influenza because the reservoirs are not just humans, but we also have birds and pigs, and until we get rid of all of those animals, um, we're never going to get rid of them. Flu. Uh, it's going to be with us. Maybe someday we will have a universal flu vaccine, but at the moment that's not the case. Uh, just a reminder, right, that sometimes, you know, they're designated these H, H something N something, so H1N1 or H2N5 or whatever. And that just uh, is looking at the profile of those two proteins found on the surface of the flu virus, the hemagglutinin and the uh, neur neuromagase. Okay, so what type of symptoms? Uh, it's a respiratory virus, so respiratory symptoms, right? So cough, um, chest discomfort, those kind of things. Um, it's usually uh, infecting deeper into the respiratory system than like a cold virus. A cold virus, you're looking at nose and sinuses. Um, influenza virus is deeper, so the chest and the cough stuff. But uh, there are overlapping symptoms with these particular viruses. And uh, that is just due to the virus replicating down the respiratory system. So the ciliated cells that we were talking about, the mucociliary ciliary system, the flu virus in some cases will just destroy those. And in some cases, people have very serious infections and it may lead to secondary infections such as pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, and other things like that. Uh, other symptoms associated with the flu are totally due to our immune system. So all the fevers and the aches and the headaches and those kind of things are the immune system kind of just trying to deal with uh, this infection. And uh, so um, these are also some of the symptoms you might get uh, from the flu shot. Usually not as severe, uh, but people do sometimes get headaches, mild fevers or chills, uh, those kind of things from the flu shot. Uh, I've had the flu shot probably for at least 10 years, maybe 15 years every single year. Uh, the only reaction I've had was a little bit of tenderness at the ejection site, with the one exception of H1N1 in 2009. Um, that one I got home and I had some chills or something, and I just remember having a bath and then going to bed. <laughs> um, so, and that's that's just the immune system saying, hey, we've got something here, or I'm high alert and trying to deal with that. What did I do? Like I said, you got to get 
So what's the treatment for the flu? Usually we're treating the symptoms, telling a person to stay away from other people, get some bed rest, those kind of things. Obviously, if there's complications such as bacterial pneumonia and things like that, those are getting treated. And um, often um, that's the case with elderly people is they're adding, ending up with things like uh, secondary pneumonia, things like that. Um, we can try to prevent the flu using the flu shot, of which there's two forms, the injectable one and the nasal ones, which I haven't seen in a couple of years. And uh, the uh, effectiveness of the flu shot varies from season to season. Also depends on which strain you get, right? As I mentioned, the flu shot is quadrivalent. It has four strains. And so if you're getting, let's say there's a fifth strain, let's say they were wrong when they decided to, you know, which formulation of the flu vaccine, they have to decide six months ago. Um, some years were wrong. And so that's a big criticism of the flu shot. Some years it's like 65% effective. Some years it's like 30% effective and those kind of things. Uh, it does help you to build up immunity. And the more times you get infected by the flu or the more times you get the flu shot, um, as you age, uh, generally, um, flu symptoms can become less severe, again, depending on, on what's floating around and, and whatnot. Um, there are some antiviral drugs available. Uh, Tamiflu may be the most famous one in the last few years. It's kind of newish in the last 10 years. And um, it's one of those things, like I said, the problem with a lot of antivirals for acute short infections is it's most effective if you give it to the person almost before they get infected or before they get symptoms, <laughs> right? And so, um, you know, there's some indication it may shorten the duration of severe symptoms and things like that. I think, uh, you know, there's some debate around the effectiveness, but, uh, you know, in the case of severe flu, um, probably the best ethical thing is to give them something that might work, right? So that's influenza. Like I said, we could talk about bird flu and whatnot, but we've already kind of discussed that a little bit. Uh, there are lots of other respiratory infections. Uh, it's worth mentioning some of these fungal infections. Uh, I think we mentioned them way back, um, maybe in topic five or something like that, when we were talking about fungi. Um, I had mentioned that, uh, you know, fungal infections, usually it's thrush and, and vaginal yeast infections or some sort of skin rash. Uh, those are kind of the most fungal infections, but there are a bunch of rare fungal infections in cases of people that are immunocompromised or in terms of environmental things, there's a fungal infection, I think that comes from pigeon poop. Um, so most of us don't have pigeons in our home or in our attic, but uh, that's not the case for everybody. Uh, and, and maybe more um, a situation for say homeless people uh, that may be uh, interacting with, with pigeons a bit more often. Like I said, certain places, I did live at a place years ago that seemed to be, uh, had pigeons everywhere. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, who knows what I was exposed to back then. Here's a couple here, there's blastomyces. Uh, this one is found in decaying wood and soil. And um, I think I showed you a map before and it's kind of most of Canada, maybe not quite as far as Fort McMurray. Um, but uh, again, this is just conditions and living conditions. There's another one here that pops up once in a while, a histoplasma that is more associated with people who are immunocompromised, uh, such as uh, uh, HIV patients. <clears throat> Um, oh, here's the map. There we go. And you can see, uh, I don't know, Fort McMurray is probably right there. So, I mean, who knows, right? I mean, this is just an approximate. So there are, like I said, lots of respiratory infections out there. We can't cover them all. Um, one other one that's kind of worth mentioning is some of these parasitic worms. Uh, if you remember, uh, we were talking a little bit about the life cycle of some of these parasitic worms, like the hookworm, and it, it will penetrate the skin and um, goes into the blood and finds its way uh, to the lungs, right? So the lungs, of course, is your, part of your respiratory system, and that sometimes leads to secondary uh, bacterial pneumonias and things like that, uh, and, and other inflammation. So this actually covers quite a few worms. If you, uh, if you look up a lot of these parasitic worms, there's, there's a few we didn't even talk about, uh, and uh, they all seem to have this lung part in there because often they're trying to get to, to the digestive system. And that's one way you can do it, right? You go through the blood, the blood leads, you know, eventually it gets to the lungs and then you can crawl up somebody's throat and go back down into the digestive system. Really gross, but that's what they do. And there's the hookworm. <laughs> Every time I see that, it scares me. So I'm just trying to desensitize myself. Okay, so um, 
skin respiratory, let's talk about digestive uh, system, okay? Uh, there are quite a few organisms that can give us digestive discomfort. Um, usually we're talking about uh, food and water that are contaminated by feces. Yeah, that's kind of like, I don't know, 90 something percent of the cases. This includes a whole bunch of bacteria, viruses, parasites, those kind of things. And um, I've tried to bold the ones, things that we've actually talked about here. And uh, this is uh, obviously mostly covering bacteria, but you can see there is uh, there's candida in there, antimuba, which is uh, a protist in there as well. So it's worth talking about these for a few minutes and talking a little bit about norovirus and hepatitis as well. So um, the digestive system does include, of course, the mouth as well. And something that I'm um, not going to cover a lot about it in terms of what happens if, you know, your, your dentist is going to tell you why you should brush and all that. Uh, uh, there's hundreds of species. Uh, one of the key ones is this one here. It's a streptococcal species called Streptococcus mutans. Um, it actually produces an acid. So this thing actually feeds on sugar and produces an acid, right? So that's why there's a connection between eating sweet foods and getting uh, gum disease, right? So, you know, what can you do? You can rinse your mouth out after eating. You can brush your teeth and those kind of things. I'm sure your dentist will tell you all about it. But uh, not going to get into this in a lot of detail. A lot of or other organisms on there, they can live in biofilms. Another reason why brushing is, is a lot better than just using mouthwash because you're um, actually physically removing the, uh, the biofilms. Um, when you start working down the digestive system, uh, most of the digestive disorders are in your intestine. The one exception is helicobacter that can actually live in the acidic environment of the stomach, and it's associated with peptic ulcers and uh, stomach cancers. Although I think I mentioned before, uh, there's different strains of helicobacter, and some strains can actually protect you against stomach cancers. So it's not something we should necessarily get rid of. And good luck with that, because probably about 50% of Canadians have it naturally. In their stomach. The question is what strain you have. And, you know, maybe someday that will be something we'll do is, uh, you know, we'll have some sort of probiotic that can uh, seed you with the proper strain and, and uh, eliminate the improper strain or something like that. But I think we're, just, we're pretty um, uh, early at kind of understanding uh, of these things at the moment, particularly cancers. Cancers are very complex to study, right? They take you know, typically 10, 20 years to manifest, how do you, um, you know, it takes a lot of time to really understand how they work. A lot of it is just ends up being statistics as well. Okay, so let's talk about diarrhea, okay? One of the sentences that, uh, you know, I know you're looking forward to all semester. Um, okay, so if you think about diarrhea, there's actually kind of two types, right? gastroenteritis, right? So that's inflammation of the bowels. And we're talking about basically extra fluids and, uh, you know, loose stools. And depending on who you talk about and where you live geographically, you know, um, what that actually means, right? You know, some physicians will say two or more loose stools in a day is diarrhea. Um, and then some places in the world that's actually quite normal uh, and, and so on. But that's the idea. You got looser stool, a lot more liquids in there. Um, and, uh, and, that, and that's... Uh, you know, not fun. Um, we also have dysentery, which is where you have um, actual damage to the intestinal cells. And so you're looking at getting blood as part of that. So bloody diarrhea, right? So common symptoms, right? You've obviously got the, um, the excessive bowel movements with excessive liquid. Um, so risk for dehydration, those kind of things. And that can lead to, uh, you know, cramps and, and, and stomach discomfort. And, and sometimes you're looking at, uh, you know, things going out the other end, so vomiting as well. And um, kind of have a list of organisms here that are, are worth talking about a little bit. Again, I have the ones in bold are the ones that we've really covered this semester. E. coli we'll talk about in a minute. We've talked about Clostridium difficile quite a bit recently. Uh, Salmonella, I'm just gonna touch on just a tiny bit here. Norovirus, I wanna talk about uh, for a minute as well. Giardia, we've touched on previously. I'm not going to come back to that one. Uh, and so these are, are, are the usual cases or the causes of uh, the non-bloody gastroenteritis, right? Dysentery. Um, so notice E. coli. This is like the normal pathogenic E. coli over here. Um, there's the hemorrhagic E. coli, uh, which the most famous one is the H10157. Um, there are a few other strains, but that's kind of the big one that, uh, that pops up again and again. Anytime you see E. coli in the news, 
it's usually the H7 or 157 or a very closely related strain. There's another organism called Shigella, which is um, some people you, you actually will classify it and say it's the same organism as E. coli. I'm not going to get into that. The difference is uh, E. coli 157 is from cow manure, and Shigella is a human to human thing, right? Uh, we also talked about um, um, amoebic dysentery, which is which is from ant amoeba as well. So let's talk a little bit about E. coli and kind of come back to that. Oh, getting ahead of myself. Clustered in, right? Remember, um, difficile for difficult, difficult to treat because it makes endospores. Okay, some people have this naturally, some people get it. Um, it's, it's a lot more common as a nos nosocomial infection in the last 10 years than it was in the previous 10 years. And uh, I think I mentioned that uh, uh, this is often what it's called is antibiotic induced diarrhea, in that somebody may can't be colonized, they get sick for some other reason, they get antibiotics. It, it, uh, it, you know, it just destroys the normal flora, gives a chance for uh, Clostridium to thrive, and it has toxins which will cause this diarrhea that apparently smells like rotten eggs. Apparently, it is terrible. Um, and so, uh, if you encounter that, apparently, you know what you are encountering. And uh, this is the one thing that we talked about that uh, um, the drug treatments, uh, yeah, you know, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. I think it's something like 40, 50, 60 percent maximum effectiveness, which means some people are getting multiple drug, drug treatments. The alternate is the fecal transplant, which is greater than 90 percent success rate. And uh, I'm guessing is, uh, as I'm seeing, it's becoming more and more common. Uh, Ten years ago, I think there were like, I think it was three clinics across Canada that were even considering doing it. Now, I, I don't know how many. Um, it's all over the place now. Uh, I, I saw online somewhere uh, an advertisement uh, of a clinic in Calgary that will do fecal transplants. Um, so I don't know about uh, locally. All right, let's talk about traveler's diarrhea. Okay, um, pretty common uh, for people that are traveling uh, to places where the sanitation of the water water treatment is. I think I had a map here somewhere. Hold on, here's the map. Um, all over the world, this may not be the most accurate map, right? Um, you know, if you look in Central America, for example, uh, there's a whole bunch of countries there, right? But Costa Rica apparently has really good uh, water sanitation treatment, and, and they say, you know, if you go there, drink the water. Um, I, Honduras, um, kind of the opposite end. It's one of the poorest countries in, in the, um, the Western Hemisphere, um, and, and sometimes some places there are problems, you know. Mexico, again, same thing, right? Um, you know, uh, it depends on, on where you're going. Um, and uh, I've seen similar maps that kind of have a little bit more detail on that. So what is causing traveler's diarrhea? Uh, often it is pathogenic E. coli, sometimes salmonella, sometimes campylobacter. There's a few other bacteria that can be involved in traveler's diarrhea. Um, if it's a protist, it's usually Giardia or Cryptosporidium. I think there's some geographical differences in terms of you know, which one you're more likely to get, right? Giardia, a little bit more associated with wildlife. Cryptosporidium, a little bit more associated with, uh, with uh, livestock, such as cattle, right? Um, generally, if you have prolonged traveler's diarrhea, we're talking about like two weeks or longer, um, it's one of these protists. Uh, if it's shorter lived, um, it's probably E. coli, but could be, could be another bacteria. So as I mentioned before as well, we're kind of in an era now where we have a lot of marketing around probiotics, and I'm starting to see products that are saying this will prevent or alleviate symptoms. And um, you know, some of them may be effective, some may not be, and they're not gonna be effective for everyone. That's the one thing we know about probiotics, but that was the product I saw in the, um, I think it was the Edmonton airport. So there were a whole bunch of strains of pathogenic E. coli. Uh, I'm not going to ask you about all of these strains, um, except for maybe 0157. Uh, the one that causes traveler's diarrhea is this one here, ETEC, right? So that stands for enterotoxigenic. So entero, of course, means in the gut. Toxigenic means it has a toxin. <laughs> um, and there's there's other acronyms for E. coli. So, you know, the E. coli people, uh, you know, go a little crazy with their acronyms here. Um, but this is the one that is usually causing traveler's diarrhea. There are other strains that cause uh, infantile diarrhea in developing countries and, and so on. 
and uh, you know we're, it's all possible of getting them if you do some traveling. Um, the kind of the thing that most of them have in common is we're talking about contamination with human fecal matter. And, uh, and that's kind of the problem. Like I said, I think I was telling you about a microbiologist who was talking about his, his trip to Mexico and he walked down the beach and it wasn't long before he found a pipe that was literally just sewage running into the ocean, right? So I think he stopped swimming after that. <laughs> um, big difference with EHEC, which is enterohemorrhagic. Hemorrhagic means bleeding, right? Uh, is that uh, it's associated with fecal matter from a cow. So that's why we're seeing it in food sometimes in terms of, uh, you know, we've got manure is being used to fertilize one crop and, and sometimes there's some flooding and it goes and ends up in the asparagus, let's say, or, or whatever it is. And so uh, this is the one that's often associated with food recalls because in, in Canada, we're not usually too concerned about human fecal contamination because we're not using human fecal matter to fertilize our food, for example, and we have good sanitation systems. Okay, so moving on to foodborne disease. Like I said, foodborne disease is usually fecal matter, human or animal contaminating something. And uh, I think I showed you this chart before uh, in terms of what are the most common causes in Canada. And um, I think actually there's a slightly different list if you look at the US and whatnot. So I don't know what that's all about in terms of uh, you know food practices or or just even culinary habits of Canadians versus Americans and whatnot. Um, but you can see there's the list there. Uh, and uh, E. coli 0157 is on the list. Worth it talking a little bit about salmonella and listeria and, uh, and norovirus. Remember listeria is often, um, it grows really well in fridges, which is why it's kind of an issue in some cases. Uh, and uh, although really not a lot of cases uh, across the country, although they can be quite severe, if you're immunocompromised or if you are a child or elderly, uh, listeria can be, uh, can be very, very serious. Uh, the number one is norovirus, so we'll talk about that in a moment. So by the way, um, people kind of use this word food poisoning kind of loosely. And... Um, you know, generally, I think when people say food poisoning, they mean you got sick because there's bad food. There's something in there, some sort of germ. Uh, you can kind of think about food poisoning in two categories. Uh, food intoxication, meaning that the bacteria or whatever growing in the food actually has a toxin, and, and that could actually even kill you. Uh, so botulism is kind of one of the big ones that we think about when we're talking about food intoxication, and that can be quite serious. So... Not going to talk anymore about botulism. We did talk about that recently. Um, and Staphylococcus aureus can also be in that category as well. The other kind of thing, which is, which is less rare, more common, is just food infection. Meaning you're eating some food, it has an organism in it, and that organism gets a chance to grow in you and then cause symptoms, which in many cases are the typical kind of gastrointestinal symptoms, vomiting and diarrhea, cramps, you know, things associated with that. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch out there, uh, kind of some of the big ones here are, of course, pathogenic E. coli, uh, 0157 being the most serious one, salmonella in some cases, listeria in some cases as well. And uh, so I think I have a slide on salmonella. Uh, normally I spend a bit more time talking about salmonella, um, but I'll say a few things about it. It's associated with animal fecal matter uh, and, and typically um, reptiles and birds. Right, so salmonella is actually part of the normal flora of birds, right? So, and we have birds everywhere, right? And, uh, you know, we have ducks and chickens as, as domesticated birds, and we've got all sorts of other things flying all around, around the planet. Uh, so that's often where it's the case. So uh, sometimes people are associating salmonella with, uh, with uh, consumption of chicken. And, uh, you know, there's lots of ideas about how to prepare chicken. I notice now they're recommending you don't even wash your turkey anymore because um, the process of spraying that could spread, you know, potential salmonella all around your kitchen uh, cabinet and whatnot. And, and so that's kind of the recommendation nowadays uh, because there may be salmonella on there. Um, you know, in and, and, and some cases of salmonella, people are, are consuming, um, you know, raw eggs for various reasons, you know, whether it's cookie dough or whatnot. I think that's not as common as uh, just being found in a spoiled meat, right? Um, the other thing about salmonella is it can live intracellularly, 
And so uh, often it's hard to treat with antibiotics because it's living inside cells. It actually has a way to get itself inside cells. And so usually it's the case where you're treating the symptoms, right? You are um, dealing with their fever or um, intestinal cramps, trying to rehydrate them and, and eventually let the immune system clear the whole thing. So that's it for salmonella for now. Maybe the footnote is if you have a pet snake or a turtle or something like that, they may have salmonella and wash your hands after playing around with your pet snake or if you handle wild ones. I do. <laughs> Catch snakes and turtles and frogs in the summer sometimes. Um, okay, let's talk about viral infections, okay? Um, we talked about herpes simplex one and herpes simplex two, right? So that's you know gonna make cold sores and, and gentle herpes. Uh, another one to mention is mumps. Um, not gonna get into a lot of details on mumps. It's part, it's, uh, part of the MMBR vaccine. Uh, we don't see it that often because of vaccination. Uh, sometimes people get it though, and it's uh, infecting the salivary gland and can lead to massive, uh, um, you know, a swelling kind of of the face and, and salivary gland area. And you can look at all sorts of pictures. Uh, maybe this isn't the best one. I remember seeing one picture on the internet of a guy before and after, and you can barely recognize his face was so, was so swollen from the whole thing. Um, I do want to talk about norovirus for a couple of minutes, okay? Uh, I know I've kind of mentioned a few times as something that's extremely infectious, extremely durable in the environment, and causes maybe a million cases per year in Canada, right? Uh, and, and, and it sucks. Um, you know, kind of the, the slogan for norovirus is you don't want it. <laughs> um, but let's talk about norovirus for a minute. And I want to talk about um, uh, hepatitis viruses for a couple of minutes as well. So norovirus uh, has many names. Sometimes people call it the stomach flu, which I told you I don't like because the flu means influenza, which is respiratory virus. But I think that's never gonna go away, okay? Uh, sometimes it's called the winter vomiting bug. Um, I, I've heard all sorts of other vernaculars around it, like the, uh, the cruise ship bug or, or things like that. Uh, and, and it's worth talking about that uh, in, in a minute here. Um, it used to be called Norwalk virus. So this is a case where a virus was named after a town or a city, I think Connecticut or something or Ohio. And the people were like, do we have to have a virus named after us? Right? So it got changed to norovirus. But you still see Norwalk virus all the time. Uh, I see it in the news. People talk about Norwalk virus. It's, uh, it's slowly going away, that name. Okay? Um, it's a non-envelope virus, and it is very infectious. So non-enveloped, that means hand sanitizer is not going to be very effective. Uh, and it's extremely infectious and extremely sticky. So this virus sticks to hands, and even good hand washing sometimes doesn't always get rid of it very well. Uh, I think the infectious dose is something like 10 virus particles. Uh, there was a case I was reading about a few years ago about an airplane, about some guy who got on the airplane and, uh, and vomited on the airplane into one of those bags. Um, so that's fun. And then like within, I think it was two weeks, they tracked and 200 people got sick from that. So basically everybody who was, you know, sitting in close proximity to this guy got the norovirus and then those people infected other people. And it was just kind of one of these cases of, of holy cow, this thing is kind of nuts. Um, okay. I said that already. Hand sanitizer is not effective. So we think it's about maybe two thirds of all cases of food poisoning in Canada. Uh, we're not really sure. It's not tracked that well. A lot of people get it. Um, you know, uh, sometimes it's kind of like a like a one puke um, bug. Uh, I remember uh, a few years ago. Uh, I think everyone in my family got it. I, I think it was norovirus, and it was the kind of thing where like every day a different person in my family was sick. And I remember the day I was sick. I just like my 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 gut just felt really bad. Uh, for about six hours. And then finally I threw up and then that was the end of the time, right? Uh, some people it's a lot worse, right? Uh, sometimes I, I know I think in class I call it the two bucket flu because it's vomiting and diarrhea, right? And uh, sometimes it can be really bad. Uh, rarely fatal, sometimes we're talking about um, dehydration issues. This is one of these curious things that uh, the virus doesn't really mutate very much, but we can't seem to figure out how to make a good vaccine for it. I think probably because it's infecting the gut not getting into the bloodstream and those kind of things. But maybe someday we'll have some sort of oral vaccine for this kind of thing. 
I think they were able to do it in mice, if I remember correctly. Uh, what else was I going to say about this? Uh, like I said, norovirus is famous for making its rounds through daycares and cruise ships and um, uh, old folks' homes and, and schools and whatnot. And, um, you know, it's something at the moment we just have to live with. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about hepatitis. I know I haven't talked about hepatitis uh, really at all, but it's kind of worth mentioning because there's different hepatitises and um, and they all have different kind of uh, scenarios of, of, of where they pop up and uh, and it's worth talking about, about those things. So hepatitis in general, by the way, means the inflammation of the liver it can be caused by all sorts of things. It can be caused by, uh, you know, chemical abuse, can be caused by uh, viruses, can be caused by uh, um, various cancers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it turns out there's a whole bunch of hepatitis viruses. I can't even keep track of how many, at least officially there's A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. I think there's even a proposed H that hasn't been identified yet. Um, it's it's kind of complex. So what are we talking about in terms of uh, symptoms? So obviously symptoms that are affecting the liver could lead to things like jaundice, uh, sometimes um, uh, swelling, inflammation of the, of the liver, Jaundice, by the way, is where you get a bit of yellowing of the skin and the eyes and things like that. Um, and uh, you can see the swollen abdomen, itchy skin, uh, weight loss, sometimes nausea and vomiting. Okay, so that's kind of what, what hepatitis is. Uh, sometimes it's not serious. Sometimes it's chronic and, and can be serious. So there's somebody there with um, uh, liver cancer. That's the worst case scenario. So hepatitis B and C can sometimes lead to liver cancer, which is, of course, um, not ideal. So like I said, this is a bunch of viruses, and they're all different. They're different viruses. What do they have in common? They're infecting the liver and causing hepatitis. So if you look, we've got uh, uh, DNA and RNA viruses, uh, enveloped and non-enveloped, uh, different virus families, and uh, different methods of getting in the body and those kind of things. I'm just going to talk about A, B, and C. Okay, um, and, and talk about some of the differences there. So hepatitis A is the classical digestive kind of pathogen, right? We're talking about feces contaminating the food and water. Um, just trying to remember, I was reading about an outbreak somewhere. I can't even remember where it was. Uh, some restaurant chain had an outbreak of hepatitis A. Uh, can't even remember where it was, Canada, the US, uh, but contaminated water, contaminated food. Um, this is very contagious, typically resolves itself, uh, you know, rarely fatal or anything like that. There is a vaccine available, so if you do some traveling, uh, again, to developing countries where you're concerned about sanitation, you can get a, a vaccine. This is not part of the normal childhood vaccine uh, routine, um, but it's an optional one that you can, you can go to a travel clinic or a health clinic, clinic and, and, and get it. And, and uh, I think I, um, I had it a few years ago. I'm trying to remember. I think I had to order it special through the pharmacy or something like that because they don't necessarily always have it on in stock. And uh, it's just a, an injection that's needed. Uh, very similar map, right, to what we saw with the, um, the traveler's diarrhea. Um, the one thing I noticed right away is that Greenland is red here and it wasn't in the other one. So I don't know much about the sanitary systems in Greenland. Um, but uh, but you can see it's it's flagged here as a place where potential hepatitis A virus transmission. But like I said, not usually that serious resolves itself. You probably don't want it. But what about hepatitis B? Um, this is a lot more serious, and uh, this is uh, something that is spread in a similar manner as HIV. Uh, it's actually a more stable virus than HIV, and sometimes, in some cases, in developing countries in particular, is actually spread from child to child, uh, presumably due to maybe scratches on their skins and somehow wrestling or something like that. Uh, they just know that there's, um, in developing countries, uh, more children have them than they were suspected in some of the studies. But you're looking at the, the typical kind of HIV transmission, so sex and drugs kind of being the big one, in, uh, in, uh, injection drugs. Um, and uh, so we're talking about blood, right? Um, no effective treatment. So this is a chronic infection, which is something that we do want to prevent, right? Um, somebody gets this thing, they have it chronically, uh, it will last for years, and they may infect somebody else, a sex partner or, or otherwise. 
Uh, the good news is there is a vaccine available and it's part of this shot here, which is like DTAP. So what is it we're looking at? Um, diphtheria, tetanus, acellular pertussis, and um, inactivated polio vaccine, hepatitis, no, hepatitis B. Um, one of these is hepatitis B. Have to look it up. Maybe the other one is Haemophilus influenza. Uh, so a, a massive shot there. Uh, it's a conjugate vaccine, so it's just a subunit of the virus. And, uh, and that's something that's been available since, uh, I think, around 2000-ish, uh, maybe a little bit before, maybe about 1995. Um, so that's something that I'm too old to have had as part of my routine vaccine. Um, but I think now it's about grade six in Alberta. So what about hepatitis C? So hepatitis C is kind of similar to hepatitis B, but it's not often transmitted by sex. Um, it can be. It's more associated with uh, intravenous drug use. Um, probably something in terms of the biology of the virus. I don't really know what, what the whole story is there, but a lot more associated with the injection drug use. Um, this is something there's no vaccine, also can be chronic. And uh, so it can be spread to uh, sex or drug partners um, in the long term uh, and can lead to liver cancer like hepatitis B. The good news is um, recently, like in the past five years, uh, there actually is an antiviral for this. And there's, so there's, there's a cure. And so this is making a big difference for, um, for people who've been infected for, for many, many years. Um, I think, um, I'm trying to think of her name, celebrity. Oh, yeah. That's the one, yes. So she has been advocating for this treatment, right? Because she was somebody who was um, uh, infected by hepatitis C. And, uh, and I think it's expensive though at the moment, but I'm not entirely sure. So kind of the summary chart, right? A, B, and C, okay? Hepatitis A, we're talking about fecal matter and there is a preventative vaccine. Um, no cure, but it often does resolve itself. It's not like a, a serious kind of infection. Hepatitis B, B for bodily fluids. So that would include blood and semen, for example. And um, um, there is a vaccine, but no cure. Uh, hepatitis C is more uh, C for circulation, right? So meaning, you know, injection drug use. Um, there is a cure, but no vaccine. So a little bit difference between all these things. And like I said, in the end, they're actually different viruses. They're just ha having some overlaps in terms of the symptoms and whatnot. Okay, uh, lots of other organisms to consider. Um, we've got protozoans. We've got uh, worms, helminths, right? Um, kind of something I notice is the protus, diarrhea, uh, the helminths, not usually diarrhea. Um, sometimes intestinal blockage can be the issue. Uh, sometimes other complications such as, uh, you know, in the lungs and whatnot, they can uh, you know, cause that secondary pneumonia and, and those kind of things. Okay, we're just flying through this. Um, let's talk about infections of the urogenital genital system. Uh, some of these infections are from your normal flora. Uh, some are sexually transmitted infections. Uh, and so we're going to just kind of cover some of these. Some of these we've talked about a little bit already. For example, E. coli being a, a urinary tract infection that can be pretty common. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, the term for uh, bladder infection is cystitis, by the way, and urethra is urethra. Urethritis is a urethra infection. Um, and uh, sometimes, in some cases, this can get more serious. It can actually make it further up in the system, and people can end up with infection of the kidneys and, and, and so on, and those kind of things. Uh, we also have sexually transmitted infections or sexually transmitted diseases. I think we're trying to move away from STD for a couple of reasons, um, but mainly one of the reasons is that a lot of these infections um, in, in many individuals are asymptomatic. So they don't have a disease, but they have an infection that could spread to someone else kind of thing. Uh, so a little bit more on that in a minute. Let's talk about urinary tract infections. Uh, here's a chart that kind of shows who is affected uh, by urinary tract infections. So you can see uh, you've got uh, infants here. And then um, for most of the chart, it's women. Or not. Exactly. It's just anatomy, right? You have, uh, you know, everything's closer to the urethra is a lot closer to the anus. 
and, and women. And um, so that's that's kind of the case, right? Um, and then men a little bit older. And any thoughts there? It's kind of gross when you think about it. Probably due to geriatric diversity um, is, is what I think is the connection there. I'd have to, I'm not 100% sure about that, but that's what I think. Um, so just basically you're looking at, for the most part, uh, people um, getting bacteria, fecal bacteria into the wrong place, into the urethra. And uh, the other thing I think I've mentioned before is uh, for women, sometimes uh, they may not have infections till they become sexually active. And in that case, uh, sometimes that, uh, again, just due to the anatomy of things being close there together. And, uh, uh, and so the recommendation is people urinate uh, after sexual contact to uh, maybe flush out the system, right? Common causes. So particular strain of E. coli, um, some people are colonized by it, some people are not. This is one reason why some people seem to get recurring bladder infections because they are colonized by their own E. coli. Uh, there's a few others out there, Pseudomonas originosa, like I told you it's gonna end up on a lot of those lists um, and a couple others there that we haven't talked about. And uh, by the way, there are some STDs um, such as gonorrhea that uh, can also cause bladder infections as well. Uh, but they're not part of the, the normal flora. Um, gram negatives, gram positives, pretty much, again, you've got the same organisms again and again. They just get to the wrong body system, they cause you trouble. So a little bit more about E. coli. Um, this one, here's another acronym, UPEC, Uropathogenic E. coli. Um, and uh, I guess I kind of said everything there is to say about it. This is kind of the number one cause. Apparently 90%, I don't remember where I got that number from, a bladder infection. And it's just good bacteria, bad place, wrong place. Uh, symptoms, um, kind of the expected kind of symptoms, right? Discomfort or pain while urinating. Sometimes, uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, um, you know, discharges or cloudy urine, which sometimes is just uh, white blood cells and things like that in there. And uh, the, uh, the diagnosis is usually a, a urine test and, and, uh, and they're, you know, gonna test it and see what's, what's in there. Um, treatment, it can, depends on what it is. Standard treatment is quinolones or erythromycin, um, things that are, are known to uh, be effective against E. coli infections. Uh, sometimes um, something else then it may warrant uh, different type of treatment down, down the road, depending on what the diagnosis comes up with. Uh, the last mention there is uh, just what we've been talking about is sometimes antibiotics from these types of infections may lead to something else, such as a yeast infection in women, uh, because the antibiotics are, of course, uh, you know, they're, they're lowering the numbers of uh, the bacteria in the system and allowing a chance for the yeast to basically propagate itself. Uh, like I said, a whole bunch of these. This is a table from the textbook. I think all of those I already listed before. So I'm just going to move on from that other to point out there are gram negatives and gram positive causes of uh, urinary tract infections. All right, let's talk about sexually transmitted infections. Uh, again, there's a whole bunch, um, but it's worth talking about the number one, number two, and number three. With a disclaimer that these may not be the number one, number two, and number three. Number one actually may be HPV. Human papilloma virus. Um, but there's a lot of people that are asymptomatic and we don't have good numbers on that. Other than that, most people, I think something like 70% of people who are sexually active will probably have HPV in their lifetime uh, and may not know it, right? Uh, but these are the number three that are um, uh, maybe a little bit more serious in some cases and, and they're all bacterial and worth kind of discussing. So I know in the, in the PowerPoints I have a bunch of slides for each of these. I've summarized it in the one slide here and uh, kind of just talking about them. And you're gonna see there's a lot of common things with these organisms. They are three different organisms. Um, the good news is chlamydia has the word chlamydia in the name. So you know what that causes. Gonorrhea, Neisseria gonorrhea has gonorrhea in the name. The bad news is syphilis doesn't have syphilis in the name. It's uh, Trepanella pallidium. Uh, and um, all three of these are technically gram negatives if you look at their cell wall structure, but biologically they're very, very different in a lot of ways. So I didn't want to necessarily call them all gram negatives because there's a little bit of debate in terms of the scientific communities. 
Chlamydia is an intercellular bacterium. Uh, in fact, we used to think it was a virus because it only grows inside cells and it's kind of tiny. Until people started doing genetic sequencing and stuff, we realized, wait a second, this is a bacteria um, uh, and we can't culture it either. So that's another thing that maybe people thought was a virus as well. So we're still, still figuring out how to culture that. Um, Neisseria gonorrhea, kind of your typical gram-negative diplococci um, related to Neisseria meningitidis. And uh, Treponema pallidum, uh, that's, um, that's kind of uh, closer related to the organism that causes uh, Lyme disease. Remember, that's also a spiral-shaped organism. Okay, what else can we say about these things? All right, typical symptoms, gonorrhea and chlamydia. Uh, you're looking at things like discharges, pain while urinating, uh, discomfort or pain during intercourse. Those are kind of the, the main uh, symptoms of these things, right? Um, syphilis, on the other hand, at least in the early stages, the main symptom is actually genital sores. Okay, so a little bit of a different thing going on there. And this is the organism penetrating those tissues and causing inflammation and and blisters and things like that. Uh, the other thing that's similar with all three of these is the asymptomatic part. Um, the exact numbers don't matter, but you can see it's kind of like 50% or more in some cases of individuals can be asymptomatic. They have the infection and don't know that they do. So very easy to spread um, to partners. And uh, this is probably why these are kind of number one, number two, and number three in terms of sexually transmitted infections, right? Uh, because it's hard to treat people if they don't know they actually have it, right? Um, all three of these as well have further complications. Um, and one of the big complications is that these infections can get further into the systems, so they can cause things like pelvic uh, inflammatory disease, and they can get into fallopian tubes and, and things like that, and cause uh, sterility in both sexes. Um, uh, chlamydia, I believe, is actually the number one reason uh, for um, uh, infertility in women. Um, if I remember correctly, I'd have to check that statistic, but that's my understanding as well. And um, so that's one of the biggest uh, complications. And sometimes, you know, like I said, as people have had the infection and um, they didn't even know it, and it's years later, they're trying to have children, and that's when they find out that uh, uh, they, that was the case. Uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea can also be um, uh, given to a, a, a child during uh, uh, childbirth and uh, can cause uh, blindness or um, other complications. Obviously, uh, you know, they can, they can affect other body systems, but blindness is the big deal. And this is why I think I'd mentioned before we give uh, antibiotics to babies' eyes when they're born. I mean, it's not that the woman is assuming the women have chlamydia or gonorrhea, but it's just in case. And, and there are other bacterial infections. And, and so it's kind of one of those things if you give them you know, some cheap antibiotics, um, it actually has the potential to prevent a lot of uh, complications around, around the region. But these are kind of the main reasons why. Uh, syphilis, you may have heard of congenital syphilis. This is syphilis transmitted to the newborn. And this actually can get transmitted uh, through the placenta, not just during childbirth, and can lead to, uh, I'm not exactly sure what type of birth defects and other complications. And all three can lead to, uh, I believe, as well, miscarriage and um, uh, premature birth and things like that as well. Uh, last thing to say about syphilis is syphilis can get into other body systems, just like Lyme disease. It starts off in one place and um, chronic disease can lead to that organism penetrating many, many tissues. Um, so sometimes syphilis, we talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary stages. Primary is the genital um, symptoms. Secondary stages, rashes and aches and, and hair loss. Uh, later dementia, we're talking about things like organ failure, or later dementia, later syphilis, things like dementia, organ law, uh, failure, a uh, whole bunch of nasty things. Um, so that's not good. Um, all three of these are treatable by antibiotics. That's the good news. Um, different tests, uh, typically chlamydia and gonorrhea, we're looking at urine tests. And uh, uh, chlamydia is a PCR test, uh, gonorrhea is a, is a PCR test, or, um, or uh, sometimes a culture. Uh, syphilis, on the other hand, it kind of depends on the stage. You know, it, sometimes it has to do with examination of the, uh, of the blisters um, and, and those kind of things. And my understanding is this, the, uh, it's a serological test for, for uh, syphilis. Okay, so like I said, 
that's it for now on these things. Um, there are other sexually transmitted infections, some of which we talked about very recently. Uh, HIV, we talked about in topic 13. Uh, herpes simplex 2, um, that's genital herpes. Um, the things to remember, it's a lifelong infection, and uh, there are anti antivirals uh, for it. Human papillomavirus, um, there's the vaccine. Again, I think that's grade 6. And... Um, and uh, I mean, the, the amazing thing about this vaccine, it only came out in 2006, I believe. And usually when we're studying cancer, we're talking about decades to understand the effectiveness of this intervention. So it's really only been about 14 years in Canada. And uh, we're already seeing the number of cervical cancer cases uh, go down by quite a bit, which is really, really remarkable. Uh, hepatitis B and C, um, we cover with the digestive diseases. Uh, so you can kind of think about hepatitis B and C as uh, digestive, if you want to call the liver digestive, uh, but they're also sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, Candida and trichomonas are on the list as well. Okay, I think we're doing okay for time here. Um, last two sections are kind of short anyway. Infections of the nervous system. So now we're talking about the brain, and uh, neurotoxins and things like that. Uh, so some definitions. Meningitis. So the meninges are like the membrane that covers your brain and other parts of your nervous system. So if that gets inflamed, um, that's meningitis. Uh, what kind of symptoms are we looking at? Um, vomiting, fever, uh, in the case of bacterial meningitis, uh, rashes, um, and then other kind of brain type stuff, so dizziness and disorientation and things like that. And in worst case scenario, we're looking at coma and, uh, and in some cases, uh, some serious damage to the brain. Uh, there's a lovely picture of the brain. And um, so how do we get meningitis? Sometimes we don't know. Presumably there's, you know, a small break and bacteria getting in there or some sort of uh, pathogenic organism getting in there and then getting access to the tissues and being able to propagate. So Neisseria meningitidis, uh, some of us right now probably have in our saliva and we're totally fine, but maybe you fall off a ladder, end up with a little break or, or just something random. Like I said, just has to be a micro fracture that we don't even know how we got it and the bacteria can get in there. So what are the causes? Um, number one cause is these three, right? So we have um, vaccines against actually all three of them now, which is one of the reasons why we're giving them to children, right? Um, and they're all technically can be part of the normal flora. Um, not always, uh, some of them I call more transient rather than normal flora, meaning they come and go, um, but uh, those are kind of the, the main cases. But any organism that gets in there, so the usual organisms, right? Staphylococcus, Pseudomonas, E. coli, all those organisms can get in there and cause meningitis. Um, Listeria, I think it's, yeah, Listeria is on that as well. and. Um, these are, are often treated by treating the symptoms, sometimes treated with the appropriate antibiotics and so on. Uh, there are viral meningitis. Um, sometimes there are certain uh, herpes viruses that get in there. Uh, there's a whole bunch that I don't really even know very much about these, uh, these enteroviruses. There's, entero means gut, right? So this is the case where there are viruses like rotaviruses and whatnot that are enteroviruses that, that, that infect the gut. And this whole group of viruses were named the enteroviruses. And then of course, later science finds out that, hey, they're infecting other body systems, but the name is still there. So again, that's a quirk. There's, some, there's a whole bunch of rare ones out there that I don't really know too much about. Um, there were two organisms that we talked about that have neurotoxins. Right, um, Clostridium botulinum, Clostridium tetani that causes botulism and tetanus. Uh, they kind of have uh, some things in common. They're ground pods of soil organisms that can form endospores. Uh, tetanus is um, is um, tetanus is a little bit of uh, 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 paralysis and uh, um, sorry, botulism is a bit of paralysis. And you can remember that because that's the same as Botox. Right, Botox is paralyzing muscles in the face. Um, tetanus is the other is the opposite. It's uh, it's not allowing it's not allowing a relaxation of the muscles. So sometimes it's called lockjaw. Another virus that can affect 
or a virus that can infect the um, um, uh, nervous system is polio. And uh, uh, it's kind of, uh, it can be covered in the digestive system area as well, because a lot of people who get polio, it's really an infection of the digestive tract. Uh, in some cases, it does end up in the nervous system, and that's where it's serious, and people can end up with either temporary or permanent paralysis. And uh, again, something that is prevented by uh, vaccination. So we have meningitis and we have encephalitis. Uh, kind of have some overlapping concepts, but uh, encephalitis is technically inflammation of the brain and um, is a lot more serious for adults than children. Anyone know why that is? What's going on with the skull in children? Yeah, it's not fused. So children actually have a little bit of room for expansion and um, tends to be a lot less serious. Um, encephalitis uh, in, in adults, and particularly elderly people, can be fatal if not treated. And often that's a case where we're treating the symptoms. We're giving them steroids to kind of you know, cool down the immune system a little bit. Uh, lots of causes. Um, rabies virus, of course, does eventually affect the brain. West Nile virus is probably the most common one we see in Canada. Uh, not in Fort McMurray because we don't really have much, if any, here, it's more southern Alberta, where you're seeing more cases of West Nile virus. There's the trypanosomes, and there's, there's prions as well. So symptoms, sometimes asymptomatic, uh, sometimes flu-like symptoms, and, uh, and brain stuff, right? So, you know, brain stuff, confusion and dizziness, and, you know, in bad, in bad cases, uh, uh, you're talking about coma or, uh, you know, coordination issues and those kind of things. Um, so a uh, couple of just some comparisons, rabies and West Nile, right? Uh, rabies, usually from animal bites. Uh, sometimes, though, uh, you can get rabies from exposure to bats. So apparently people who do um, uh, caving and get exposed to bats sometimes uh, get exposed to rabies. Uh, West Nile virus is a bird mosquito thing, but sometimes the mosquitoes, they find somebody else. So you got warm blood, there's no bird around. I guess, right? You know, mosquitoes tend to be a little picky, but if they're hungry uh, and you're in the right place at the wrong time, uh, then, then you can get West Nile virus. Most people, it's mild flu-like disease. Um, some people get extreme encephalitis and that's where it gets dangerous. Uh, particularly the more elderly you become, the more serious West Nile is. Uh, we also talked about the pork tapeworm as being a potential uh, infection of the brain. So this doesn't happen all the time, but this is when sometimes people get infected by the eggs and the eggs think that you're a pig and the larvae hatch and the larvae can go to all sorts of body systems. If it ends up in the brain, this can be a neurological disorder. And this happens every once in a while. I was just reading the news about somebody in, um, in Toronto who was having seizures and eventually they did the brain scan and it was a worm. And there's a, there's a brain scan. And then there's prions, um, kind of talked about them a long time ago, and uh, we're talking about infection of the brain. Okay, circulatory system, um, mostly some definitions here for you, and uh, kind of covering a couple of things. Uh, so one definition is bacteremia. And this is kind of the worst case scenario of usually what another infection can lead to, right? A catheter infection or a... Um, you know, a skin infection can lead to bacteremia, which is the infection of the blood. And this can lead to sepsis or septic shock. And so I think I have um, a couple of slides on this, kind of just going over septic shock and toxic shock, uh, which, like I said, it's not too important to really know all the details in terms of what is going on here. Both of these are cases where you have an infection, usually of the blood, and the immune system is getting too excited and can lead to all sorts of things fevers, chills, low blood pressure, um, in some cases, organ failure. Uh, so, you know, lots of uh, potential symptoms because the immune system is just going a little bit crazy. Septic shock is usually from gram-negative endotoxin, so part of the uh, outer membrane. Toxic shock is usually from um, toxins secreted by staphylococcus or sometimes streptococcus. So just a little bit different in terms of the origin, a, little, a lot of overlapping symptoms. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, can be mild or, or can be quite severe in both cases. All right. Toxic shock syndrome. Uh, yeah, just 
kind of overlapping symptoms and stuff, right? So we did talk about a couple of uh, infections that are more exclusively blood infections. Uh, one way back at the very beginning was plague. Plague spread by uh, a flea. Again, we're talking about another animal disease that sometimes humans can get. Uh, and Lyme disease, Lyme disease is um, usually uh, infecting mice and ticks and deer. Um, and humans, you know, again, end up at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, ticks are a lot less picky than uh, mosquitoes. And so, like I said, if you're in the wrong place and uh, that tick was just feeding on an infected mouse, then you can get Lyme disease. Uh, mono, uh, also infection of the uh, uh, circulatory system. Uh, specifically, mono actually infects T lymphocytes, kind of like uh, in some ways similar to HIV, uh, but you can usually get immunity against it uh, after being infected. No vaccine for this one yet, but maybe we'll see. And uh, super common. Um, it's estimated that 95% of us will have it before we're 30, and um, a lot of us may be asymptomatic. Some people will get quite sick. Uh, I had it in grade 10, and I just remember being in my bed for like a week and not moving, um, and that's what I remember from it. <laughs> One other thing about mono, uh, Epsom bar virus, is it can cause a variety of symptoms. It's also famous for causing different types of lymphomas. Uh, Burkitt's lymphoma uh, in people who are immunocompromised or malnourished. And uh, that's actually, uh, I can't remember, it was Epstein or Barr who studied this and realized that, hey, viruses can cause uh, cancers. Um, that's kind of uh, uh, a big discovery uh, historically. Uh, also, HIV and AIDS. Um, again, I'm not going to cover this anymore because we've kind of talked about it already just recently. There's a whole bunch of other uh, diseases that infect the blood that are uh, transmitted by vectors. Uh, so malaria being the big one, uh, Chagas disease being a little bit more geographically isolated to Latin and South America uh, in general, but it is something that's getting a lot more emergence and a lot more press because uh, uh, it used to be, I, I think the Americans were in denial that it was being transmitted in the US until recently. And because uh, America does have uh, you know, at least subtropical regions, places like Florida are quite warm, and these bugs do live there. Okay, not quite the end, but we're almost at the end. Okay, I know everyone's been waiting for the end, right? Um, first, just wanted to say, you know, if you're, if you're, um, Christmas is coming up, if you're, you're looking for any microbiology themed gifts for your loved ones, you can get the, uh, the giant microbes. Um, there's also, you know, a little more classy ties and scarves. So we checked out my tie today. Um, I realized I hadn't worn it all semester. See, it has some different bacteria and viruses on it. It has Pseudomonas and E. coli on it, two of the organisms I worked on, why I chose this one. Um, there's a whole bunch of things out there I've been finding. Uh, T-shirts and wrapping paper, that's exciting. Um, if you got a little bit more money to burn, you can buy something a little more high-end. This is about $10,000 for these sculptures. Um, Anyway, a little, little side uh, for you. Um, let's talk about that exam, okay? Uh, as I mentioned, I have some uh, review sessions and things like that coming up. So I have a review session tomorrow that will be in-person only, review session on Monday that will be on Zoom only. They are probably relatively similar. You're welcome to attend both if you wish. Uh, when, or, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm gonna call it study hall because I don't know what the format is gonna be yet. It's gonna be maybe a little less formal than the review sessions. Um, I'll maybe just have the study questions available and ask people you know, what they wanna cover. Um, not sure yet. So we'll leave that open. If you just wanna drop in halfway and see what's going on, that's another option for you as well. I just wanted to have all these times available for anybody who needs help to get help. Uh, it's also possible that, you know, on Friday you want to come, but you haven't really looked at things yet, so maybe you're finding it's not worth it to, to uh, get some help until you've had a chance to look at the material. So it's kind of up to you. Um, I'll have an office hour as well on Thursday, uh, and all of this is during the regular class time, 10.30 to 12-ish kind of thing. And then Friday is the exam in Fieldhouse 4. So where is Fieldhouse 4? I told you I was going to make you a map, so I did. Oh, it's not there yet. Hold on, I gotta change PowerPoints. Another thing 
know, we're looking for a break, a little play game. Calvin Hall. They just always crack me up. And they're kind of light humor. humor. He says, Abra, Dabra, Hocus Pocus, I come out my microbiology studying to be done, be done. I may change my work. Uh, he, he said, good work. Unfortunately, he said, grass. Um, okay, so. Or, but this is the uh, this is the plan for the layout of the uh, of the exam. Um, it will be all the usual types of questions with one addition. Uh, what I'm calling a fill in the blank table. Okay, and I'll show you what that looks like in a few minutes here. Um, I'm going to give you for the short answer and case studies some options. So the case studies there'll be three and you pick two kind of thing. Uh, hopefully that will help people out. The short answers. You know, it'll be pick, you know, five of the following seven or, or, or eight or something like that. You know, kind of whatever fits on the page for that. Uh, so hopefully that will help you out a little bit with your uh, uh, with, with your responses. Just a reminder um, to be complete with your responses. Get away from one word answers, examples. Those kind of things are always very good and are going to uh, help your, your grade. I know some people, the written component was what where they really suffered. So make sure you are thorough in your, in your written response. Question? Are you going to do like one of the ones that you have on the PowerPoint? Um, no, not necessarily. Um, usually, uh, you, you know, usually I find something else. So think about some of the organisms that we've talked about uh, uh, more recently. So Staphylococcus is fair game, E. coli, Clostridium. You know, those are some things that we've covered quite a bit over the last little while. So you know, there's lots of questions I can ask you about that, right? Um, so where is Fieldhouse for? Okay, well, there, there we go. So I made a map. Okay, uh, if you're coming from the Purple Palace or if you're coming from the library, you're going to go way over down there past King's um, Lounge and IT services and keep on going and keep on going around a couple more corners and you're there. Okay, I will put this map on Moodle um, and, uh, and have it with the, uh, um, with the schedule that we have coming up so that you can, you can find it. Uh, make sure you're there early. Okay. Uh, the, the rule is we're not supposed to allow people in if you're 15 minutes or more late. Okay, so you do not want to be late. You show up at 16 minutes, I might be able to convince. It depends on who's in charge, right? Um, if I'm in charge, I'll let you in if you're 16 minutes late. Um, but that's that's usually the rule. Okay, and they're trying to be very strict about examination rules. Uh, bring your ID. Okay, everyone will be checked for ID. That's standard practice for exams. Uh, I don't know everyone's names. Maybe like 10 of you actually know. Right. Um, so make sure you bring your ID. It can be your piano ID or some other photo ID. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. You know all the usual exam rules. You know no drinking, no smoking. You know stuff like that. Right. <laughs> um, oh, the other thing is, um, you know, if you have your phone or something like that, it's going to be you're going to probably put it on the floor. And the other thing I'll be looking at is um, watches. You know, smart watches. A lot of people have those kind of things. So just you know, put it away. Okay, there'll be a place, I think, on the side for you to put your bags and stuff as well. Oh, some questions there. Let's see. Okay, two questions. One, somebody's asking about whether you need proof of vaccination. I think, yes. Um, I think the security is just looking at your IDs on the way in. That's what they're doing, right? So assuming you have the... The, the yellow thing on your ID, then security will let you in, and that's all good. Um, otherwise, I don't know what the protocol is, um, but you may want to check with security if you have a concern. Uh, somebody's asking about can you come see your midterm tomorrow? Uh, yeah, book an appointment. Uh, tomorrow I have a, at least a meeting or two, um, and you can just book an appointment uh, by emailing me. Okay, so just a reminder about these things. Uh, I think everybody, most people had them filled out correctly. One thing that happened to me that, that kind of caused a few errors is people with student numbers, right? Some people have three zeros at the front. Some people have four. Remove all the zeros, okay? And that will help me out a lot. Um, other than that, it wasn't actually a bad system. It was a trial thing we tried, and we're, we're going to subscribe to it or buy a license or whatever it is. It worked out well. The other thing is, if you do have an error, um, just cross it out and, and, and fill in the new one, and that will be detected um, when, it, when it asks me to review any mistakes. The other thing is, um, if you could use pen only, that would be great. 
Um, there were a few issues of people that had used pencil and then they erased and the, you know, the eraser stuff gets all over and then that jams in the photocopier. So use pen only or don't make mistakes. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah, and like I said, if you make a mistake, not a big deal. Just cross it out um, and, and fill in the right one or, or write a little note there and that will be detected by the scanner and it will ask me to review that particular question. Okay. Um, some other study tips. There's tons of study tips out there on the internet. Uh, you know, the number one that I have for you is don't try to do this all in one night. Spread this over, you know, a few days. Uh, that's how you solidify things in your brain. You study and you sleep. Sleep is actually how your brain will form longer term memories. Okay. And so it's important that you study, sleep, crystallize some memories, and then review to kind of, you know, have them kind of get a little bit more solidified in the system. Like I said, there's lots of other tips out there. You know, uh, I also like this one here, number two, study for 50 minutes and then break for 10. And, uh, you know, try to do something physical during those 10 minutes, whether it's just doing the laundry or going for a jog or something like that to sort of get your brain a chance to recharge. You know, if you go for too long, um, you know, you're going to not have the endurance to survive all the way through exam week. Uh, you know, sleep and uh, eating well and those kind of things are only going to help you, okay? Um, Make sure you review the study questions, okay? Uh, try the practice questions I have on Moodle. I think there's been a couple people that have tried them already. I put some uh, practice questions on Moodle, multiple choice questions. They're all from the textbook uh, test bank. So they're not ones that I've written, but I tried to choose ones that I thought were more, more relevant to everything that we talked about. Ask questions, come to review sessions, things like that. Okay, so what did we cover? Um, Topics one to 10 are there, and this will be 25% of the grade. So the way that I work this usually is um, I take two multiple choice from every unit, right? And then um, most of the other parts of the exam are from the later half. It's hard to say what's in what unit because some of these things we've talked about again and again and again, right? Like HIV, we talked about in topic six, and then again and again, and eventually topic 13. Um, you know, I probably won't ask you complicated questions about the HIV life cycle. That was kind of way back, but you know, you should know things like reverse transcriptase. That's the main target for many of the drugs, kind of key to the biology of the organism and so on. Um, so worth it to, you know, do a quick flip through these things, okay? And make sure you refresh yourself on some of the, some of the, the, the key details. If, you, if you're unsure what is a key detail, um, you know, ask me, right? It doesn't hurt to say, is this important to know for the exam? I can, I can just you know, answer yes or no really quickly. It's very easy to, to email me that. Um, the rest of the topics, so these are all uh, you know, two to three lectures each. Um, and this stuff is quite uh, information dense for the most part. Uh, so do make sure this is the, where you focus your studying, okay? And, and, and learn all this stuff uh, well. So another thing I was gonna show you is um, just some studying methods, and these are from different students that have tried different things. Um, so this is this mind map thing, which I'm always trying to figure out, but apparently people like it and it works. You can see the student, she made a mind map of the mechanisms of pathogenicity. And uh, I think she said for each of these, she eventually ends up making a full page um, uh, for each of these. Uh, here's another student who did a mind map thing. This is, looks like it's all the, um, the drugs uh, this is from some sort of app. I don't know if she's reading this on her phone. I can barely read it on my phone here. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, anyway, there's there's lots of different mind map systems. Uh, I like this one a little better. As I was mentioning before, you know, with your brain, uh, you know, your brain likes to have things up and down or left and right, diagonal stuff. Brains don't like that. So as you make your notes, you know, make them tidy and neat, and that's going to help you um, uh, with your learning. Uh, here's from another class. Um, a student was showing me his notes. And this is actually kind of similar to what I did as a student. I try to take each unit and make one page of notes. And then, you know, rather than having, you know, 100 pages of notes, now I had six pages or 10 pages. And then I'd sometimes take that a, a level further and then study off those pages and remake them a few times. And by then, I usually am starting to learn, you know, know the material uh, pretty decently. Okay, so just a quick tour through the topics. Okay, I have a few practice questions. Hopefully we're done in about five minutes. I might go a couple minutes over time just to make sure I, I drive home a few points. 
Topic 11 was disease transmission and epidemiology. So there are lots of terms and definitions around that epidemic, pandemic, endemic, those kind of things. Um, we also talked about some concepts around transmission and, um, and things like uh, sources of organisms. And I'll, I think I've got a slide for each of these. And there were quite a few organisms we covered. These were some of the ones that we maybe spent more than, a, than 30 seconds on. Um, and, uh, and then these ones are ones that kind of just, they, they popped up again and again in, in many of the units as well. All right, so first, what do we mean by sources of organisms? By that, I mean reservoirs. There were a couple of people actually asking me about this because I think one of the study questions uses that term, but I, I, meant, I meant reservoirs. So maybe I'll, I'll edit that study question for the future, okay? So four different reservoirs and lots of examples. Make sure you know some examples, okay? Uh, you know, it's a very fair kind of question, right? Uh, you know, the film blank section or something like that. You know, give some examples of, you know. Modes of transmission. Uh, again, something good to know examples of. We had contact, vehicle, and vector, right? Contact really means touching, sometimes directly or indirectly, like indirectly to be a phone uh, Droplet, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of close, right? You're, you know, respiratory droplet. Vehicle, um, it means, you know, air, water, and, and food. And vector usually means some sort of insect or arthropod is bringing it from one person to another. Um, susceptible hosts, that was a little bit more on the following unit, but it's kind of the usual list, right? Immunocompromised, very young, very old, uh, people in the hospital, uh, and those kind of things. So hospitalized, of course, means no sacromial infections. We talked about different reasons why people might be susceptible to uh, hospital-acquired infections, right? So things like they're already sick, there's already germs there, there's invasive procedures, uh, and so on and so on and so on, okay? So make sure you know, um, you know some of those uh, uh, variables as well. All right, sample question. Which of the following diseases have similar means of transmission? I don't know what all they are, but I know the answer screaming out to me. But maybe I wrote the question. The answer is West Nile and malaria, right? Both transmitted by mosquitoes. Yeah. Maybe because I hate mosquitoes so much, too. That one's screaming out to me. Um, the most common anatomical site of hospital borne infection is. This one's a little harder because you've got to kind of actually detail the area. But uh, the answer is actually urinary tract, just because catheters are so common in hospitals, right? Um, the other ones, I think, like that's 33% or something, exactly one third or, or, or even more. The other ones are a little bit less. Uh, fill in the blank, right? Some of the fill in the blank will be, um, you know, a little bit more open ended, like a fomite is. So, really, I'm just asking for definition and. Uh, I'm Ah, come on, there we go. So what is a fomite? Definition, uh, two examples. So some of my fill in the blank are more good examples of this kind of thing, right? Examples, all the things you can imagine that might spread disease. Uh, some of the things I hope none of you are sharing. I hope nobody's sharing toothbrush or something like that. Just partly because that's one of the, you know, in my mind, one of the grossest things anybody could ever do. <laughs> uh, Topic 12, microbi microbiomes um, and also, uh, you know, mechanisms of disease, right? And so the microbiome, again, there's many uh, things that are part of your flora that are also potential pathogens. And again, it's kind of the usual suspects, Staphylococcus, uh, Pseudomonas, uh, E. coli, Clostridium, and so on. So I'm just going to go through these quickly. Resident microbiota are typically found in all the following locations of step. And the answer here is actually the lower respiratory tract. And we just talked about that last day. I'd mentioned that there's very few, if any, organisms there naturally, unless you are actually kind of sick. Is it possible to be infected but not diseased? True or false? True. We just talked about that. Sexually transmitted infections, good example of that. Um, typhoid Mary, another example. I think I actually have that right there, typhoid Mary. Although we can call her by her normal name. I guess it doesn't matter. She's one more. So you don't have to be nice to her. 
um, mechanisms of pathogenicity. There's a huge list of stuff here, and I went through each of these kind of things um, with various examples. So when you study, know what each of these things mean and know an example or two for each, okay? Again, those are, are kind of just very, they just, it's setting me up for great fill the blank type questions. You know, where I'm gonna ask you, give me two examples of um, ways that organisms, uh, you know, penetrate or invade host tissue or two ways they evade the immune response or, you know, something like that. Okay, so I'd recommend knowing two examples for everything. More doesn't hurt, um, but that's how I would study this legal reception. Okay, a few definitions thrown out for things like, you know, ID50, infectious disease 50, um, adhesins, uh, there's a bunch of uh, terms in there you might want to know. All right, question there, I see. Yeah, so somebody's asking if I'm taking two questions from uh, multiple choice from the first units. Yeah, two questions from all units is what I'm looking at, and that makes up about, uh, you know, 40, um, 40 or, or so multiple choice, right? Sample fill in the blanks. We have two examples of exotoxins. And you're thinking, how many do we actually cover? Um, possibly more than this. This is just off the top of my head. All right. So a lot of these, there are more than two examples. Sometimes it's not necessarily in that part of the notes. Sometimes it's another part of the notes. Um, but uh, like I said, six examples there. Claims of probiotics. So again, you know, something that we did talk about and uh, something that hopefully you remember a little bit. All right, topic 13 is the immune system. We talked about um, three lines of defense, innate and adaptive immunity. So make sure you know uh, a bit about some of these processes and whatnot. Some we talked about in more uh, detail than others. Uh, first line of defense, we talked mostly about the skin. There are other uh, aspects to innate uh, immunity that we didn't cover in a lot of detail. Uh, we did talk about inflammation and some of the other processes. Second line of defense is um, we're talking more about stuff in the blood uh, and, and, the, and the body systems. Uh, so inflammation is the big one that we talked about. We didn't talk too much about interferons or the complement or fever, uh, just a tiny bit on each of those. Wow. Almost there. Like I said, I'm gonna go a couple more minutes over time. So I should be done in two, three minutes here. Uh, third line of defense, adaptive immunity. So we talked a lot about uh, humoral immunity and cell-mediated immunity. So make sure you can kind of compare and contrast those. Um, I'll do a little bit of that uh, in the review sessions. Um, so if you're looking for a little bit more information on, on these processes, um, I'm gonna talk about it a lot more in the review session. We also talked about vaccines. We talked about six types, okay? So make sure you at least have a, a basic understanding of what each type is in terms of what's in it. And, uh, you know, again, something, an example or two might not, might not hurt um, to know an example or two. We also talked about immune system disorders, two categories, hypersensitivities, which is allergies and autoimmune diseases, and immunodeficiencies, which some can be acquired, some can be uh, uh, you're born with, okay? And AIDS being the big one that we talked about. All right, I am just going to um, skip through these. You can take a look at them. I do have these. I do have these slides posted on, on Moodle. Um, there's the body systems. I found these nice images. So the last unit we talked about the body systems, uh, infections of the body systems, I actually found these nice images that talk about bacterial um, infections by body systems. So you can take a look at this. Not all these organisms are relevant to this class, but uh, it's got a big list there uh, and uh, might help you with your study. There's viral infections, uh, protozoan and helminth infections, and um, fungal infections. Okay, a couple more sample questions there and a couple other things to mention. So there will be some short answer questions uh, slash fill in the blank. Like I said, uh, some of them are gonna be a little bit more involved than others. Most of them worth one or two marks kind of thing. What we've, kind of what we've seen before. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about this fill in the table question. This is gonna be 10 marks out of 80 and it's gonna be just like this. It's going to have four columns. So the name of the disease, what's the name of the organism, uh, how do we classify it, and what is it infecting, right? So here's an example, the beef tapeworm. Uh, the name of the organism is given. 
So what is it? It's a helmet, right? It's a, it's a worm. Uh, what body system is affecting? That would be the digestive system. Um, AIDS, HIV, um, I would probably accept blood as well as infected body system. Rhinovirus, nice. It already tells you it's a virus. So you can get half a mark just for putting a virus there, right? Uh, what is it infecting? What's the disease? This is the common cold. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, traveler's diarrhea. Um, some of these may have more than one answer, right? Traveler's diarrhea. You could put Giardia. You could put E. coli. Um, you can put staphylococcus, you can put gonorrhea. Uh, so there's actually multiple answers there. Just make sure that your organism, whatever the organism you, you have, um, you, you tell me the right classification, right? If it's already a leomoprotus, for example, right? Uh, COVID-19, um, that's the name of the disease, the virus. I would accept the acronym for this and that uh, respiratory and or vascular system uh, would be the answer to that. So this would be 10 marks. Um, and it's going to just test you on a bunch of these things. Uh, and uh, so, you know, as you study, do make sure you, you learn a little bit about, you know, some of the names of the diseases and the organisms. Okay. This is the last slide. Okay. So thank you for coming. Thank you for all your questions all semester. Um, I'll make myself available coming up to the exam. And, um, you know, in the future, anytime you see me, Say hi, please. Okay, I love it when students say hi. If you have any microbiology stories to tell me or ask me about, I'd love to hear about it. If you don't want to shake hands, fist bump is fine. Those kind of things. If you see me in the hospital, um, take good care of me. <laughs> um, that would be wonderful. Um, you know, I did actually, um, not too long ago, my son actually broke his arm. And uh, it was kind of crazy how many former students were involved in that process. You know, when we brought him in, um, right there, there were two of them in the intake at the emergency. Uh, during the surgery, there was another one. During the follow-up care, it was another uh, former student and it was all good. It was, they, they were just amazing and professional and, um, and it was great to see them again. Um, obviously the circumstances, you never wanna be at the hospital under an emergency circumstance, but it was, it was really nice. So look forward to seeing you in the future and um, we'll, uh, we'll see you over the review period and, and during the exam.